The backlash became a demand this week for the Florida Department of Education to rethink and redo parts of the new African American history standards that led to national debate with much of the focus on just one line in the 40 pages of curriculum that benchmarks how slaves developed skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. Those are the verbatim words. Critics erupted at the possibility students would be taught there was an upside to the American atrocity of slavery. The Department of Education doubled down this week, insisting that is not what the curriculum says and not what it does. This has been interpreted to mean slaves benefited from slavery, and that is not the standard at all. What this is saying, what this is saying is, this is not the story simply of victims who withered in the face of oppression, but rather the story of a resilient people who responded to their oppressors in an adaptive manner, utilizing every resource at their disposal to resist the inhumane nature of the bondage they were in. That was the department's social studies director explaining or clarifying the intent of that at the summer seminar on all the new standards held in Miami Dade this week. We talked to a number of teachers there who weighed in with varying perspectives, as you might expect in this state at this moment. Today, we get a firsthand perspective from one of the 13 people in the work group who wrote the standards. Dr. William Allen is Emeritus Dean and Professor of Political Science at Michigan State, former chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, appointed by former President Reagan, and volunteered on that work group. Dr. Allen, we are grateful for your time today and hopefully your candor. It's a pleasure to be with you. So we spoke earlier in the week. Um, there have been developments daily on this. And as an African-American man, and as someone so involved in the civil rights arena, how do you hear this backlash from people who are genuinely perceiving this to be an, an affront and are galled by the fact that students might be learning this? That, that is an honest perception. Well, there's an easy example by which I can show you how I hear it and perceive it and the fundamental error that's involved in people's discussion of it. I'm a Floridian. I was raised in Fernandina Beach, which, of course, was segregated, and I was educated in segregated schools. If I said to you I had an excellent education, you would be mistaken to think that segregation was responsible for my excellent education. When I speak of my excellent education, I'm crediting my teachers and my classmates, my colleagues not segregation, but under segregation, I had an excellent education from which I benefited. That contemporary, modern day example is no different than what the curriculum is saying about 150, 170 years ago and more, that coping mechanisms are part of every biological organism's uh, portfolio. And in human beings, those coping mechanisms have to do with resilience, intelligence, industry, fortitude, determination. To say, therefore, that people who were held in slavery were not deprived of their humanity, it ought to be intuitive to every intelligent being. And that is, of course, what the new standards in Florida have said. So the, the new standards um, are probably 40, more than 40 pages long. And if they're on our website for anyone to go in there, it's a public record, you can read them. And, and it does really go through a very comprehensive look at uh, pre-slavery, slavery, post-slavery, post and, and to suggest that it, it is not comprehensive, just is not factual. However, this one line, the, the words personal benefit to me seem to be what's perceived as, a, as an affront, as an attempt of turning something positive uh, about an American atrocity. So instead of fighting about it and, and digging heels, which seems to be happening, why not revisit the language and not change the lesson you're trying to impart, 
but change the wording of it um, in, a, in a more collaborative way. Why, why not? Well, well, you know, Ms. Milberg, I could accept one modification, and that is a modification that referred to personal and community or social benefits. Because, of course, it wasn't just the individuals who benefited, but this entire nation ultimately benefited from it. And that could have been expanded. But anything that would deny benefit deriving from human exertion, even under the extreme conditions of oppression, would be false. And it would be dehumanizing. The idea that you should not speak of people making whatever utilities they could in the circumstances in which they found themselves to their own use and benefit is dehumanizing. You might as well say they aren't capable of doing anything because that's what you end up saying. You're saying slavery is so complete, so thorough, that no person held in slavery retains his or her humanity. Well, these curriculum standards can't say a thing like that. And I would hope that no one in Florida would want them to say a thing like that. So prior to this particular curriculum, which isn't being taught yet, I think it's next next school year when it finally mm -hmm. bubbles up into the classroom. What's different about that than might be being taught now? Because teaching about enslavement in public schools, it's taught every year, maybe not as yes. formally, but, but there is curriculum in Florida schools. So what, what would be the difference? Here's the critical difference, and, and it's, I'm so glad you asked that question because it's critical not only in Florida, but in the entire country. This is the first standalone set of curricula standards for teaching African-American history. Florida is a path breaker in this regard, and it's setting a standard that people ought to rise to rather than trying to find some way to evade. We have to confront the reality that Understanding our past requires two things fundamentally. One is learning from the past in the words of the past, the way people experience the past. Secondly, learning from the past in a way that surfaces the fundamental humanity. Because unless we retain our sense of fundamental humanity, whether we're talking about the Holocaust or slavery or anything else, we lose sight altogether of any worthwhile justice or any worthwhile objectives that might be pursued. I can't imagine anyone would argue with that concept. And, and since you brought up Holocaust education, Florida does have Holocaust education. Yes. Um, there is no benchmark, no curriculum in the Holocaust education that might suggest that people who were in concentration camps learned any skill or benefit benefited from anything that they might have taken, even though there are stories of resilience and, um, and cunning from the in camp, uh, the people who were interred. Wouldn't that be apples to apples to put something in that curriculum as well? And I, I can imagine the backlash there as well from especially this community. Well, I, I don't have any problem with saying, yes, those stories are legion and it, and it is there. It may not be in the standards that were crafted for that curriculum in Florida, but it's present throughout discussions of the Holocaust. It's present in the National Holocaust Museum. The point is that people are always burdened to emphasize the extent to which human beings retain their humanity. And to retain their humanity is to insist that they find, in whatever the circumstances are, any opportunity they can exploit to their advantage. The word advantage, the word benefit, there's no difference between those words. So, so this, this is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt. No, you go, please so, go right ahead. So this, um, this is in the political arena and, and isn't everything in our day and time. Yeah. Yeah. In Florida especially, we're a very divided state at a very divided time. And, and it seems, just in our reporting this week, that conservative thinkers are very supportive of this curriculum and, and behind it vocally. And more liberal thinkers are behind this backlash and, and many take it very personally and individually. Why do you think this is such a political issue now? I, there was a report in Reuters just in the last couple of days which I would call your attention to, which suggests deliberate exploitation of the issue and deliberate distortion. 
and points to not just Vice President Harris, but an entire operation at the campaign level for the coming election that has fastened upon this as a wedge issue that can be used to divide and to stir up the base. Now, I don't know if that's true. I'm citing to you a Reuters report. The politics is of no interest or concern to me, frankly, but I understand as a political scientist and someone of some experience in these matters, that politicians sometimes do things not on the basis of principle, but on the basis of momentary perceived advantage. And I think you're speaking about something that's happening, we've seen on both sides of that aisle. Dr. Allen, if you sit with us for a couple of minutes, we have to take a quick break. I'd love some more time with you when we come right back. We are back with Dr. William Allen, who is one of the 13 people on the work group that wrote Florida's new African-American history standards. Now so much in the news. Dr. Allen, I know um, that your time on this work group was as a volunteer. I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of the group and maybe you'll take us a little bit behind the scenes of how that went. And I want to start with this question. This work group, this whole writing of the standards was specifically so that this uh, curriculum could comport with Florida's new laws, framing race education and sex education as well, but for our purposes today, uh, race, race history. And, and in the new law, there are words that describe how no lessons can um, make a student feel guilty or feel shame. Uh, it's, that's not verbatim, but that's the concept in the new law. And I wonder if that was top of mind as you and your group were writing this. Were, was that line in the new law very important or a priority of sorts for you to fit everything into? Certainly not. We were, of course, referred to the new legislation because our existence was mandated by the new legislation. And therefore, I assume that people in general were familiar with that and other portions of the language in the statute. But there was no point in my recollection, and it's on public record, so I can speak about this. There was no point at which anyone ever made reference to uh, trying to avoid offending someone's feelings. And, and let me give you one clear explanation of why that might have been, which also applies to the way people are reacting to the published standards. A soundly educated human being knows the difference between inference and implication. And inference is what one imagines a statement to mean. And implication is what the statement intends, conveys. So the difference between inference and implication means precisely that no one can foretell or preclude inferences. Now, with regard to implications, there was no attempt whatever to imply anything that has been attributed to these standards in the current discussion. The work group that did this was arranged, I think you mentioned, was arranged specifically to do this task. Yes. So there, the first thing I did when I started to report on this whole thing, as most of us do, we hit Google, <laughs> see, lay the net and see what we could find. And there is, the state has an African-American history task force made up, and, and it's a venerable task force, been around for years, and that has been the task force that has, I guess, guided or um, suggested what goes into, until now, Florida's curriculum. What has, and that was appointed by the education commissioner, which has been a, a conservative for the past decade, two decades here in Florida. So, so why was a new task force necessary? Well, I can't answer that question. As you know, I responded to a general appeal. Uh, I didn't inquire into the motivations for constructing a separate work group. But we all know from general practice, historically speaking, that sometimes having dedicated task forces proceed far more directly with less bureaucratic inertia to accomplish a purpose. This happens at every level of government throughout the world. And so it's not surprising to me that someone who was determined to act expeditiously and get a job done wanted to get it done with a clear focus, laser-like intensity, rather than get lost in a maze of traditional practices. 
So the 13 people, including yourself, were uh, all volunteers responding like you did to this call. Mm -hmm. um, John Dubell, who is the Department of Education's Social Studies Director, we met with him this week. He, he was at the seminar locally uh, presenting the curriculum to teachers. And he was telling me he was in the room when your task force finished writing this curriculum and was very proud of the accomplishment and actually applauded is what he described. And now in the news, a couple of, uh, uh, this week actually, bubbling up in the news are reports that some people on that task force were actually opposed to this, uh, this specific line we're talking about and some other things. Um, no names given, sourced as anonymous, do, do you know what to make of that? Were, was there opposition in that room with you? I know, yeah, I know precisely what to make of it. As I think I've told you before, the record of the deliberations is completely public. It's recorded. There are transcripts as well as audiovisual. Anyone can research that. No one will find any statement of that kind of opposition, period. So on your task force, this was unanimous? It was consensual. It was consensual. We were we deliberated in a collaborative fashion. We reached consensual agreement. We were not following parliamentary procedures. The civil rights organization, U.S. Uh, civil Rights Commission that you chaired a few decades ago, mm -hmm. is an organization focused on inequality, a uh, history of inequality, and inequality in real time. Give us your opinion, your expert analysis are do we have are we experiencing inequality still in the united states in real time well let me say first the function of the civil rights commission is to appraise the enforcement of civil rights laws and to make recommendations to strengthen them where needed so it, this, this mandate is not simply to give opinions about inequality or equality there will always be inequalities among human beings for one obvious reason. Human beings are differently endowed. The endowments are God-given with respect to our fundamental rights, and those are the same for everyone, but with respect to our particular talents or characteristics, they are diverse. And we expect to see that diversity everywhere. So we do not focus at the Civil Rights Commission, at least in my time, and I don't think they're doing it today, on the question of inequality as an abstraction. What we do for care about is the imposition of inequality artificially. That is the unequal enforcement of the laws. And there it is absolutely critical that the commission and all other such agencies work with eagle-eyed intensity to root out artificial inequalities. Dr. William Allen, I know you upended your own schedule to be with us today. I am deeply grateful for that and appreciate your time. You are most welcome. I didn't get to finish my worship service this morning, but I was sufficiently inspired. <laughs> I think someone will be looking down on you favorably. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.